There's none like you, Adonai, and there's nothing like your deeds. God, you rule eternally. Your kingdom lasts for all generations. Adonai rules, Adonai rules. Adonai will rule forever and ever. Adonai will give strength to God's people. Adonai will bless God's people with peace. Merciful Father, favor Zion with your goodness. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, for we trust only you, ruler, God on high, sovereign of worlds. Well, let's go ahead and open up the doors to your Kodesh. Whenever the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, Adonai, and scatter your enemies. May those that hate you flee from you. Therefore it shall come from Zion, the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Blessed is the one who in his holiness gave the Torah to Israel. Continue on page 101. Praise be the name of the sovereign of the universe. Praise be your crown and your place. May your love for your people Israel last forever. May the salvation of your right hand be revealed to your people in your holy house. Grant us the goodness of your life and accept our prayer with mercy. May it be your will that we be granted a long good life and may I be counted among the righteous so that you will have mercy on me and protect me in all that is mine and all that belongs to your people Israel. For you are the one who nourishes all and sustains all. You rule over all. You are the one who rules over earthly rulers and sovereignty is yours. I am a servant of the blessed Holy One. I bow before God and on your gods for at all times. But in any human high trust who would rely on an angel and the God of heaven who is the true God, whose glory is true and whose prophets are true, and who multiplies deeds of goodness and truth. In God of my trust and in God's holy honored name I speak praises. May it be your will that dwell in my heart to Torah and completely answer my heart's desires and those of your people's Israel for good, for life, and for peace. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and have our report procession. We don't have any kids with us today, so the report procession will be less fun. <laughs> let's go ahead and do this. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad.
Roberts. We do not have a Cohen or a set of Israel with us today. So when you come up here and, and place a Cohen and bless the Torah, page 104. could be America's deadliest natural disaster in a century. New Orleans leaders all but surrendered the streets to floodwaters and began turning out the lights on the ruined city, perhaps for months. Mayor Nagin called for an all-out evacuation of the city's remaining residents. Asked how many people died, he said, minimum hundreds, most likely thousands, the actual death toll was 1,833. I wonder how many people that were here this morning would remember where they were on the 14th day of August in 2005. I do remember where I was on that 14th day of August. I was right down the road that was working at the time at the slave lot that sat right in the triangle as you come around to Fort Campbell Boulevard. And that particular day was a very solemn day for me. 
I fasted that day. And I prayed continually that day because of what I knew was supposed to happen on the 15th of August, 2005. What's remembered by most folks as the disengagement from Gaza, as I remember the expulsion from Gaza, began on the 15th day of August, 2005. Rabbi says in the final days of August 2005, Hurricane Katrina bounded the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. New Orleans was evacuated, and the entire city became flooded after the hurricane passed. Television screens around the world were filled with images of people who did not or could not, because of poverty or disability, leave when the evacuation order came. Some were wading chest deep through filthy water in what had been their neighborhoods. Others were trapped in apartments and on rooftops waiting for days to be rescued. Those who had finally escaped the floodwaters found refuge on the bare concrete expanse of interstate highways waiting again for help. Others were transported to huge shelters would they be warehoused for days until someone could figure out the next step? And many of those shelters were in surrounding states, by the way. And those images remind us of the question, is there justice in this world? Is disaster a punishment for wrongdoing? Conversely, is there a reward for doing right instead of wrong? This week's parasha opens with a promise of reward for those who do right, but later portrays the limitations of reward. On that 14th day of August, I actually called the Israeli embassy to ask that it be considered at the very least to put off the expulsion from Gaza. And I still remember the young lady that I spoke with, I can't remember her name, but she and I cried together and prayed together on the telephone. As that began, as that expulsion began, a little tropical front began, a little pro tropical depression began to spin right off Bermuda. And by the time you reach the end of August, as those final folks were being literally drugged from their homes in Gaza, our people were fleeing their homes in New Orleans. It shall come to pass, they're told, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine and your oil the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land of which you swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. That is from chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. The rabbi goes on to say there may be a reward for doing right, as this passage states. But one of the early sages, Antigonus of Soho, downplays its importance. Don't be like those who would serve a master on condition that they would receive a reward. Rather, he said, be like those who would serve without that condition. And even so, let the fear of heaven be upon you. His distrust of reward may arise out of the historical setting in which he lived. And that historical setting is hinted at, by the way, by his name. He is the first of the major rabbinic figures to have a Greek name. And he lived in the era when the land of Israel was ruled by the Hellenistic Empire established by Alexander the Great. Many Jews lived in Israel in those days, but it was hardly that scene of reward that was promised in Deuteronomy. Under the imperial occupation, as during the New Orleans flood, the lesson is that even if reward is slow in coming, one must remain faithful. 
centuries later under a different foreign occupation, none other than Yeshua. Likewise, instructs his disciples not to serve on the condition of receiving a reward or an expectation of a reward. So likewise, you, when you've done all those things which you're commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. That's from Luke 17. At the same time, Yeshua does promise a reward to his followers, both in this age and in the age to come. In Mark 10, verses 29 and 30, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who is left house, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lambs, for my sake, and the gospel, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. That's a little promise. The promise is a little different from the promise in Parashadi Kid because it comes with persecutions. But the Torah also reminds us that rewards have their problems. In chapter 8 of Deborim, Verses 10 through 17, we're told when you have eaten, they were told, when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes which I command you, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Too much my involved in all of that. I have heard it said before, and I truly believe, and I think Moshe makes the point in Deuteronomy that the greatest danger that a society faces is not one of poverty or insecurity. The greatest danger lies in affluence because we tend to convince ourselves that we are responsible for what God has made possible for us. That reward should lead us to be wary. Prosperity, affluence, can make us forget God. In the contemporary world, the nations that are most prosperous are filled with secularism, unbelief, and depravity. Falling under that deception that my power and the light of my hand have gained me this wealth. Surely, says the rabbi, in the midst of materialism and consumerism of our own world, we need to be and constantly be on guard. And the practical instructions of Torah about care for the poor might provide a safeguard for us. Again, from Deborah, 15th chapter, verses 7 and 8. Moshe says, if there's among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates of your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his needs, whatever he needs. The rabbi said, I once encountered a man who appeared a bit deranged begging on a street corner and crying out, I need $2.89 for a plate of spaghetti at Tommy's. There was a restaurant nearby. Rabbi Reston said, I walked right by him, but it hardly gotten across the street when I felt compelled as if from above to go back and give the man $5 so he could buy lunch. When I walked away, I thought, but who knows if he really even needs the money. And I have myself given money to people who seem less than likely, but I do know as he does know. The rabbi says that he felt who knows if he needs the money, but if he needs, whether or not he needs the money, you need to give it to him. 
We may never have an answer in this world to the questions about justice of the rape of Katrina and the New Orleans flood or other calamities. As we keep our hearts and hands open to the poor among us, however, we guard ourselves from the deceptiveness of prosperity, even prosperity that we might consider or won't consider a reward from God, and will always help poor among us. For the poor will never cease from the land again from Deuteronomy at their brain. Or if Yeshua reminded us, will you help the poor with you always? And whenever you wish, you may do them good. The poor have many needs, but we who have much also need them. I will praise and thank you once more for the day that's before us. We thank you for the rain that we are beginning to fall on the desperately needed. And we pray, Father, that your spirit would dwell upon each one who is present this morning and throughout our good day. And open our hearts and minds to understanding and the Ruach would anoint our brother Quentin as he brings our message. We thank you for this wonderful place to which we come for the Shabbat that brings us here, for your word that brings us wisdom. And we're thankful, Father, for each precious brother and sister who is present with us this morning. It's hard for us to even begin to imagine the love that you have for each one. <coughs> it tells the story that Calvary is still beyond understanding. For myself, uh, the most amazing thing in this world is the knowledge that you know me better than I know me, and somehow you love me anyway. Thank you for that love and enable us as a congregation and as individuals to go from this place prepared and ready to share your word with those who need to hear that good news that never ceases to be with us. God has used us, correct us, Lord. We pray, wish him to sure. In Jesus' name, amen. Page 106, 107. Uh, this blessing is recited by anyone who has come, uh, who has recovered from a serious illness, returned safely from a long journey, or survived any kind of danger, including childbirth. Do we have anyone who fits that bill today? Here. Okay. I want to say anything? No. We reply in English, but you can choose whichever language you like. Okay. You tell me what I'm the, the Hebrew. I don't know the way it goes. I can just read it. So, look at that. I'm like, I'm looking in the left of the bar. I go in the air. The Haavi. The God. She. Gamala. Me. Oh, God. So. May the one who is so good to find you continue to grant you every kind of goodness. Amen. Alright, someone else. Okay. Uh, page 109. Well, Bill Carroll. Understand for this part of the service, we always have a story of healing in Scripture because faith comes through hearing and hearing the Word of God. So let's go ahead and hear our story about healing. Thank you. 
those oppressing you with their own flesh. They will be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then everyone will know that I, Adonai, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Yahweh. Adonai says, Where is your mother's divorce document which I gave her when I divorced her? To which of my creditors did I sell you? You were sold because of your sins, because of your crimes which your mother divorced. Why was no one here when I came? Why, when I called, did nobody answer? Is my arm too short to redeem? Have I too little power to save? With my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I turn rivers into desert. Their fish rot for lack of water, and they die of thirst. I dress the heavens in black to mourn and, their, and make their covering sound. Adonai Elohim has given me the ability to speak as a man well taught, so that I, with my words, know how to sustain the weary. Each morning, he awakens my ear to hear like those who are calling. Adonai Elohim has opened my ear, and I neither rebelled nor turned away. I offered my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. For Adonai Elohim will help me. This is why no insult can wound me. This is why I have set my face like flint, knowing I will not be put to shame. My vindicator is close by. Let whoever dares to accuse me appear with me in court. Let whoever has a case against me step forward. Look. Adonai Elohim helps me, who will dare to condemn me? Here they are following apart like old, mocking clothes. Who among you fears Adonai, who obeys what his servant says? Even when he walks in the dark without any light, he will trust in Adonai's reputation and rely on his God. But all of you who are lighting, lighting fires and arming yourselves with firebrands, go, walk in the flame of your own fire, among the firebrands that you lit. With my hands this fate awaits you, you will lie down in Listen to me, you pursuers of justice. You who see Adonai, consider the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were dug. Consider Abraham your father, and Sarah who gave birth to you. In that I called him when he was only one person, and then blessed him and made him many. For Adonai will comfort Zion, will comfort all her ruined places, will make her desert like Eden, her Arabah like the garden of Adonai. Joy and gladness will be there, thanksgiving, and the sound of music. Praised are you, Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, rock of all the worlds, righteous in every generation, the faithful God who says it and it is done, who speaks and it is fulfilled. Now have a reading from the New Testament. The reading this morning from Marie Hubbard comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, and I'm reading for those who'd like to read along, verse chapter 16 of Matthew, beginning with the 13th verse and reading through the 20th. That's Matthew 16, 13 through 20. When Yeshua came into the territory around Caesarea Philippi, he asked his Talmudim, who are people saying the Son of Man is? They said, well, some say Yochanan, the Immerser, others are the Yahoo, still others are Yermiyahu, or one of the prophets. But you, he said to them, who do you say I am? Shimon Giva answered, you are the Mashiach, the Son of the living God. Shimon Bar Yochanan, Yeshua said to him, how blessed you are, for no human being revealed this to you. It was my Father in heaven. I also tell you this, you are Kepha, which means rock or stone. And on this rock I will build my community, and the gates of Sheol will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you prohibit on earth, will be prohibited in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth <coughs> will be permitted in heaven. Then he warned the Talmudim not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, the Messiah. On page 117. All of God's words are truth and righteousness. For you are faithful, Adonai, our God, and your words are trustworthy. Not one word of yours is ever taken back unfulfilled. For you are a dependable and merciful ruler. 
Praise are you, Adonai the God, who is dependable in all your words. Have mercy on Zion, for she is our life's home, who saved the humble so quickly in our day. Praise are you, Adonai, who causes Zion and her children to rejoice. Cause us to rejoice, Adonai our God, with Elijah the prophet, your servant, and with the kingdom of David, your anointed. May he quickly come and gladden our hearts. May no stranger sit on his throne, and may no others inherit his glory, for you bow to him by your holy name, that his light would never be extinguished. Praised are you, Adonai, shield of David. For your Torah, and for the worship, and for the prophets, and for the Shabbat day that you gave us, Adonai our God, for holiness and for rest, for glory and splendor. For all these, Adonai our God, we thank you and praise you. May your name be praised perpetually forever. Praised are you, Adonai, who sanctifies the Shabbat. Continue on page 121. On 121, we have a prayer for our country, which obviously stands in great need of prayer. And I'd ask that you pray this prayer with me on 121. Our God and God of our ancestors, please accept the mercy of our prayer for our land and its government. Teach our leaders the values of your power. Help them understand your rules of righteousness. So that our land may never lack peace and tranquility, prosperity, and freedom. I deny God of the spirits of all flesh. Send your spirit to all the inhabitants of our land and to bring love and brotherhood, peace and friendship among all the nationalities and places of the land. A proof of their hearts any hatred or enmity, jealousy or rivalry, to fulfill the yearnings of your children who delight in its honor and the desire to see it be a light for all the nations. May it be your will that our land will be a blessing to all the inhabitants of the world, and that friendship and freedom will reign between them, and that the vision of your prophets will soon be fulfilled. Amen. And on page 123, a prayer for the state of Israel, and obviously Israel also stands in great need of prayer. And I ask you to pray this prayer with me on page 123. Our heavenly parent, rock of Israel and its redeemer, bless the state of Israel, first cloud of our redemption, shield it under your loving wings, and spread over it the circle of peace. Send your life and truth to its leaders, ministers, and advisors, and guide them rightly with your good advice. Spring from the hands of the defenders of our holy land and lead them, God, to deliver them. Crown their efforts with victory. Grant peace to the land and eternal happiness to its inhabitants. And let us say, Amen. All right. Let's go on over. Let's go. We usually just get this page, but let's do it. We'll do it in English for this best who are used to it. Let's do page 127 and 129, and we'll go on down to the United of Lewis and Adonai. Every day you live in your house, they shall continue to praise you. Happy people, for this is so. Happy people, whose God is Adonai, the son of David. I'll honor you, my God, ruler, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and sing praises to your name forever and ever. Praise Adonai, great to be praised. There is no limit to God's greatness. One generation shall praise your deeds to another. And tell about your mighty deeds. I will speak of your splendor and glory and your wonderful deeds. They will tell of your power and mighty acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They will recall your great goodness and sing of your righteousness. I know it's gracious and caring, patient and very kind. I know it's good to all and merciful to everything that God made. All your works shall praise you and I, and all your faithful ones shall bless you. And shall speak of the glory of your rule and talk of your might. Do not see many as God's great uh, greatness and splendor of your glory and glory of God's rule. God, you rule forever. Your kingdom is for all generations. God holds up all the fall and comes to us repent over and stand straight. The eyes of all look to you with hope, and you give them their food at the right time. You open your hand and feed everything that lives to its heart's content. A nice good in every way, and kind in every deed. A nice tears to all the calls, all the calls done sincerely. God does the wishes of those who respect God. God hears your cry and saves them. And I will protect all who love God, but God will destroy the wicked. And I will speak praise of God, and all beings shall bless God's holy name forever and ever. Amen. We shall praise God now and forever. Hallelujah. Let's see that last little uh, asterisk right there, and we'll move on into the typical reading. The Nagu never yah, and Tabe Adolam, hallelujah. Let's do the next four processional. 
Janelle's not here today, so I'm going to do the announcements. I don't think I'm as much fun. Unless, Tammy, were you going to do the announcements today? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Just thought I'd check. Um, uh, all right. So I have something to hand out to all of us. And you can tell I kind of made a lot. Uh, so one for each family, because um, I want to make sure that they do get around. Thank you. Uh, I actually don't Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> All right. Here it is. We've been talking about this. Um, and it's it's ready. All right. So if you look at this, this is our fall holiday lineup. And last year, we raised the bar. And we said we're going to do a lot more this year than usual. And this year, we're raising the bar just a little bit higher. And this year, I'm saying... We probably won't do more. This is probably it, right? But that's what I was saying last year. So we'll see what actually happens. But this is a rundown of what to expect. Rosh Hashanah on Sunday, September 25th at 6 p.m. We're going to have our Seder meal, complete with fish eggs. It's going to be something. Um, we're also going to have our Ma'ari prayers there. Um, shofar service the next morning at 9 o'clock a.m. Yantan Ben Avraham is going to be the one helping us with the shofar blowing. And I'm very excited about it because he's got big lungs and he told me he's practicing or he's going to start practicing like now. Uh, great, great man. I, I can't wait to do this. Um, that is one of the Shabbat. Um, that's one of the days that we do not work, we do abstain. Um, however, because in the ancient world we didn't know what day the new moon was going to fall on, we always celebrate for two days. Nowadays, we know what day, but even so, we still practice for two days. So you'll see that morning prayer is there for the 27th as well at 9 o'clock a.m. For the next 10 days, the days of Teshuvah, we are going to have a prayer vigil up until um, the 4th. What is a prayer vigil? That means that you'll come here and at least me, at least I'll be here, but there will probably be a couple of us praying at any given time. And what we have been saying and teaching is that we say, go into the next holiday season, pray up. It's a prophetic season. It's an important season. It's a spiritual season. And so we want to make sure that we are as close to Hashem as possible during this incredibly important season. And if you need prayer, we will always be here to pray with you. Now, this is not a hard and fast schedule. You might come in and find out that there are 10 people here. You might find there's one. Or you might see like a sign on the door that says, had to go. Why would I Why would I have to go? Well, okay, first of all, many other churches run from us. Um, but also, look at Yantan Sukkah. That's falling right in the middle of the, of the vigil. Yantan Sukkah is a mitzvah that we're going to be doing in the days of Teshuvah to help us get ready just for Yom Kippur. Here's Yantan's situation. Um, and I'm just going to give you the short version. For those of you who've been here for the last two years, you know what his life has been like. And I know you watch Yantan, so uh, shalom. Um, but he's had a rough two years. And his mother has been in a nursing home for this time when she should not have been in a nursing home. Uh, basically, his surgeries had one complication after another after another for the last two years. And because of that, he has not been able to take her out of the nursing home. That means she also went through COVID-19 in isolation in the nursing home. And what is finally happening is he's finally getting better, as I said, but his mother really needs home care. And so what we're going to do is we're going to help him clear out his attic. And he's going to be upstairs in his attic. He's going to turn that into a bedroom, but it's full of clothing. Um, and what we're going to do is, men, we're going to take this clothing and throw it out of his window in piles. I have sent pictures to the faculty and staff here so they have an idea of what we're dealing with. And the woman down below, we'll have tables down below, are going to take it and sort it into piles for goodwill, for keeping, and for throwing away. All right, if it's too old, if it has holes, whatever, throw it away. Uh, if it looks vintage, not old, vintage, we'll keep it. Um, or we'll give it to goodwill. We're clearing space for him so that he can move upstairs and then he can give a room to his mother. So this is not just a day of 
let's go into Lake's house. This is a let's help resuscitate two lives. We are also going to build Yantan a suka because um, honestly, Jonathan, I know you're watching, but um, he hasn't been able to get up uh, for really the last two years. And so we're trying to help him as best we can fulfill the mitzvah connected to the holiday season. Um, and I know that he is, uh, he is a conservative Jew. He comes out of that movement. Um, and so that will require a halakhic uh, suka. And so we're going to go ahead and get that ready. So men, first we clear the room. We let, we let the ladies and partners take care of the rest. And then we're going to go ahead and build a suka. Um, I'm not sure how much um, wood he has. He's told me he has wood. I don't know if it's enough for a suka, but we can we can see. And then there's a load not far about Hobby Lobby. We'll just not, the Home Depot. We'll go there, get the rest of the wood, and finish the project. That's Sunday, um, October 2nd. And yes, we will still have our meat club prayers, um, which will take 10 minutes. Yom Kippur. Here's the big one. I was told that my schedule was overwhelming. And I said, is it overwhelming? And Carol, you looked at it and said, I guess not really. It's just Yom Kippur. Um, you know, it's all piled into one day. We're going to start off Yom Kippur on October 4th with a cold Nidre service and a Yis Kippur memorial service. If you have lost someone in the last year, come to the Yis Kippur service and we will memorialize them. The cold Nidre service is incredibly important to Messianic Jewish discussion, and especially the issues of forced conversions by the church upon the Jewish community. It is something that needs to be addressed outright and with sensitivity. So we will have a cold, a cold Nidre and a Yis Kippur service. That is how we will kick off our Yom Kippur season. I am currently writing for it, but we have our Siddurim over there. The next day, we will have all day fasting from 9 to 6. Um, really, the fasting begins with Kol Nidre, but the, 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 the prayer vigil part is 9 to 6. We will be wearing our kittles, we will be wearing white, we will be wearing our white kippot, we will be wearing our talit all day. Um, but really, the heart of it is we're going to be doing a lot of prayer and a lot of scripture reading. Morning prayer commences at 9 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, we have Mika and we have the Yona reading. At 3 o'clock, we're reading the book of Revelation. And we have some teachings on why we do that, but there are parallels between the book of Revelation and Yom Kippur. Same with Matthew 5 through 7. And we found that that was really the perfect way to transition last year into the Ma'arit Nebula's service. Nebula is the closing of the gates. And so what we're doing is we're getting our most important prayers up at that time. And then we're going to have to break the fast. In other words, we're going to IHOP. Um, I said it last year, we looked like some sort of cult descending upon IHOP, you know, just all these people dressed in white. It was, it was hilarious. Um, it was awful. Um, just be aware. Um, uh, so yes, that is our schedule. And what I really just anticipate is a lot and a lot of prayer. And if somebody comes up and says, hey, Quinn, I feel like we're really supposed to read the book of Haggai or something. And we have time? I'll say, yeah, let's go for it. Um, it is spirit-led. And we're going to find that very often the spirit fills our prayer times with very intense prayers, prayer sessions, and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of scripture. So that's what to expect out beyond before. If you cannot make it for the whole Yom Kippur day, please join us for at least some capacity of prayer. Um, but the one holiday on this that I am stressing above all others is Ma'arib Nehila. Um, that is our most important prayer service. That is our most important service out of the year. Um, and I thought that last year it was beautiful, um, and this year I think it's going to be even better. Um, so please, that's the one where we're really going to pray it in. Sukkot. Okay, some of us are doing Sukkot, some of us are not. Um, we're going to have one here in the back. Um, and so that way, if you don't have room for a Sukkah, if you don't have the ability to build your own, you can come here and serve the mitzvah that way. Um, my encouragement is eat at least one meal in the Sukkah every day, um, if you can. We're going to have a, a movie night. I'm sorry, we're going to have morning prayers, which we already do that every day. The only difference is we're going to be waving the lulav this time. We're going to have morning prayers. Uh, then we're going to have, uh, on the 15th, Abdallah and the movie night. Of course, what movie are we going to do? That's all I'm saying. 
It was busy, of course. Um, it gets funnier every time I watch it. Um, so, Abdallah, movie night. And maybe we'll pull out some games. Um, last, last year we finished watching the movie and no one played games. So, I don't know if I'll do that again. But something else I want to see take place during um, Sukkot is I want to see people just having fun with their families. In Israel, we call these days Kol Haloed, Kol Haloed. And what it is, is it's half days. People work half a day. And then they go out to the zoo with their family. They go to the beach, they go on vacation. Guys, I want to go on some hay rides. Yeah, I said it. I want to go on a hay ride. And I also want to go, don't judge me. I also want to go to the corn maze. I want to go to a pumpkin patch and pick up, okay, listen, guys, I just want to have fun. It's the fall season. <laughs> um, guys, enjoy each other's fellowship. Have being nights. Have dinner in each other's suka. Just have a good time. Please. Um, it's meant to be our holiday of joy. It's commandment. You must rejoice during this time. Um, and in Israel, you'll see this in the Jewish Museum, there are people who literally go around like on the tops of buses and trucks, dancing and encouraging other people to dance because it's a festival of joy. Hashanah Rabbah. I'm not going to lie, I don't know if anyone's going to show up to this one. Um, if you can, you can. Um, if you want to, you can. 8 o'clock a.m., we're going to have our Bima here. What we're going to have is our lulav, and we're going to walk around it seven times, praying for rain. Where do we get this festival from? We get it from the temple. Because that's what they would do on Hashanah Rabbah. They would go around to the altar, and they would basically beat it with their lulav, and they would beat their lulav against the ground, praying for rain. This is the solemn assembly in which Yeshua stood up and said, if anyone is thirsty, you can come to me, and I will give him, or I'm sorry, rivers of living water will flow out of him. Yes, that's the festival that he interrupted. Um, and so we'll probably incorporate parts of that into our service as well. Then Simchat Torah at 8 o'clock, no, 6 o'clock, right? Um, Simchat Torah. We have never done Simchat Torah here before, um, and that was partly a scheduling mistake on my part last year. I meant to do it. But what we're going to do is we're going to have two Torah scrolls. Yes, two Torah scrolls. And we're going to march them around the room seven times, singing joyfully. What songs have we picked out? I'm glad you asked. Um, I've only picked up two songs so far, but we have a large list that we could pull from. We want to keep this easy and accessible. We don't want it to be daunting. We're also going to have Torah portions being read from the end of the Book of Devarim and the beginning of the Book of Bereshit. And we're going to do it all in one night to show that the study of Torah is cyclical and it never stops. Well, we also find that there are words at the end of the book of Devarim that are said at the book of Bereshit at the beginning, and phrases that you haven't found since the beginning of the Torah. And the reason we have that is it shows that the beginning and the end parallel. And we'll talk more about that as we get closer to the season. But understand, Hashanah Rabbah, Simchat Torah, those are the festivals we're ending on. Simchat Torah is good for kids. I wanted to tell Kayla that because she's not here, but if, if anyone sees Justin, if anyone sees Seal, if anyone sees Kayla, so no, these are good holidays for children. Um, so Simchat Torah, a good one for dancing as well. And we're going to be bringing in, I hope, two people named Bill and Joanne, uh, who teach dancing and they do a lot of just good worship stuff. Um, let's flip, flip it over. And you'll see the cheat sheet, just in case we forget anything, like what do we do or what are we celebrating. This, this is just the bare bones. Uh, Rosh, Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, we celebrate by eating apples and honey with a little shofar, and it's a kingship. It's almost like saying to spiritual sleepers, wake up, the king is coming. Yom Kippur, we see where we have that scripture. We fast with all comfort, including food and water. We wear white to represent purity. And it's commemorating the closing of the gates. Sukkot, a festival of rejoicing. We wear lulah. Um, Eat it. Uh, I'm encouraging you to eat at least one meal of sukkah every day. We'll see if that happens. And Hashanah Rabbah and Sukkah Torah. The cheat sheet. Now, you'll notice what I don't include on the back is where are the Messianic connections. The reason I didn't include the Messianic connections is because I feel like the Messianic world, we tend to know only the Messianic connections, but we don't tend to talk about what the holiday actually meant originally. And rather than replace the original meanings, it's more like Messianic connections help amplify the original meanings. So that's why this is here. If I was in a congregation where, or if I was in an actual synagogue, I might be talking more of like down in Nashville, so like Sheriff or 
West End. I might be talking more about Messianic stuff, but of course, in the Messianic world, we have to talk more about what are we actually doing. There are a few people that I think are going to be with me all day young for. There's a few people who are going to be with me for Rosh Hashanah. There's a few people who are going to be with me constantly doing Sukkot, building Sukkot. Um, and I encourage everyone here, please do join. Okay? I cannot stress this enough. We are to be in prayer. And people ask me, how much should I pray? And when I, I say that biblically speaking, there are times when it's best to pray because it's best for you. It's best to pray early in the morning because it's giving God that time before any of the junk comes, you know, before your mind just you know, filled up. It's also biblically good to pray toward the afternoon when the day has kind of already happened. But the truth is, scripture says pray at all times. And so I like to say start small. Don't overwhelm yourself. If you say, you're, I'm going to sit down and pray for an hour, you're going to fall asleep. Every time, I promise you. Start for 10 minutes, start for 5 minutes, start for 15 minutes, start for 20 minutes. And then go from there. Then you'll find yourself praying for an hour and a half, two hours, and you're like, wow, we just started. That's what prayer is like. It's the same with Scripture. Scripture, for a new believer, can be a very daunting subject. Um, I feel like scripture is more attainable and easier for us to access because it's right there in front of us than the subject of prayer. Prayer can be tricky because it's it's more esoteric. It's more mysterious. But it is the great discipline. We should be in daily scripture reading and daily prayer. And I love how um, Charles Spurgeon put it, great preacher. He said, people ask me which is more important, scripture reading or prayer. He says, I ask them, What's more important, breathing in or breathing out? <laughs> daily prayer, daily scripture reading, and I am encouraging everyone here to be in prayer, being into the young before season. So look where, look at your prayer life and analyze it and ask yourself, where am I praying, where am I not praying? Don't judge yourself needlessly, okay? Be sober-minded. Be acute. Look at it, see what's actually going on there, ask the Lord for illumination, and then, okay, maybe I can add five minutes here. Or maybe I do pray a lot in mornings and evenings, I don't need to. Maybe I didn't need to go to my lunch break. Or maybe I need to invite friends over, the neighbor over, to pray with me for half an hour on Thursdays. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you what it looks like. This is your walk with him. I'm not telling you what it's supposed to look like. But you will find out. One of the most shocking things to me was when I was praying about four years ago now, and I was just on a teacher. Right? No, that's five years ago now. I was teaching here five years ago, and I was in prayer, and I was getting all sorts of good stuff, and the Lord told me two words, and they wouldn't go away for in liturgy. And I had never heard that before, and he told me, Lord, it's nothing has better increased our conversation with our Jewish visitors better increase our witness to people who come from the synagogue. And now the fact that we do have somebody from Sheriff who says this is the only Messianic congregation she'll actually visit, or we've actually taken a whole family from there, it tells me that I probably heard right. And so what I'm going to say is be in prayer. Please. You cannot afford to neglect prayer. And I often, and I, this is me, and I could be wrong. I think that prayer is the discipline. Because they can put you in a camp and take away your Bible. Mm. But they can't take away your ability to pray. That's my assessment. But once again, I'm not saying that at the detriment of internalized scripture and know it so that you can say it throughout the day and so that you can always be in the Word. Be in the Word and be in prayer. All right, I think this is everything. Um, Something else, and this is just, I'm shooting this out here. Yes, we've had two health victories in the last week, uh, last two weeks going. Um, there have been a lot of people who are going to the hospital. Um, one of them is my grandfather, and uh, his name is Joel. And I happen to know that his Hebrew name, his bar mitzvah name, is Yehuda. His name is, his name is Joel. You won't even know what to do with him, right? Um, keep him in your prayers. Um, he went to the hospital this week, and there was gross negligence on the part of the doctors, and they just got killed. 
um, and have said this should not have been a bad thing, and it, it really was. Um, for those of you who've been here for a week, you kind of know what happened um, because it all happened at the same time. Um, there are a few other cases I don't feel like I'm at the liberty to speak today. But there's a few more cases in our congregation where we need to be lifting each other in prayer. All right. Look at a few of the common faces that are here and look at who's not here today. That's all I'll say. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for Yeshua. Lord, I'm so thankful for the congregation. I'm so thankful for everything I see you doing. Lord, I pray that you make us responsible and mature explicators of the word. Lord, I pray that the teaching of the word and the proclaiming of the word is uh, incredibly pleasing to you. And Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to come and speak to us as he sees fit, and that we receive from you today what you want us to receive. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bible, you know, always gets All right. So last week I asked a question. I said, "What very famous passage of scripture is in our Torah reading?" And what was the answer? Yeah. The Shema, Deuteronomy six four. Yeah, and everybody knows it. What very famous passage of scripture is in this week's Torah portion? Shema. You can't be tricked. <laughs> yes. The Shema continues in this week's Torah portion. Let's take a look at what we're dealing with this week. So we have Echev. Now Echev actually means um, because. Because. And I misspoke earlier this week. I said that Echev meant something else. What was that word? The Monday teaching, for those of you who heard it. I said it meant heal. No, it's just a very similar sounding word. And it's the same root word as Yaakov. Um, so the words are connected, but they're not the same. My, that was my mistake, I'm sorry. Um, but the word connects anyway. Because Echev is that heel, that last part of the body. And what is the last thing that you receive uh, for obedience? It is the reward. It is the after effect. So we see how these words are connected. And people say that this is a reference to Mashiach. Because... When is the first time we see the heel in Scripture? Genesis 3.15. You will bite his heel, and he will crush your head. Now, there's many ways of seeing that through time. But what we see here is that this word that Moshe is taught, set, using to explain crossing going over the river, you are crossing over today. Crossing over is not easy to translate in English. It's not possible. Because it is a participle that is disassociated from time. What does this mean? This means that they are crossing over today, but they are also crossing over today, today. Israel is always crossing over into the Promised Land, over the, or through the Jordan. It is a continual, constant thing. It is not literal, it is not metaphoric, it is literal. What did I just say? It's not spiritual metaphoric, it is literal. They are literally crossing over today. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 3. I won't make us go there right now. But what it says is, make sure that none of you has a hard, deceitful heart that turns away from the living God. And what he does is he compares his own generation with the generation that had to come out of the land of Egypt. And he says, they were going to the promised land, but they did not receive their inheritance. Don't be like this generation that had the Messianic promise, the Messianic go presented to them, and they weren't able to receive it. This second generation was able to receive. And part of of what helped them qualify was that they were able to cross over after the death of the first Redeemer. You see, Moshe misspoke. He said everyone has to die of this original generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, before you can go over to the land of Egypt. Unfortunately, that doomed Aaron and Miriam as well. They didn't particularly rebellion, but Moshe misspoke. So the original generation had to die before they were able to enter the land. Understand that the land of Israel will only be able to enter into that spiritual inheritance that was promised to it by the death of its second redeemer, Yeshua HaMashiach, the true redeemer. But enough of repeating. There's one more 
from it. There's one more passage I want to talk about here, and then we're going to move on into today's teaching. Moshe says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of Hashem. Not a great translation. Because it's not man. There's something else there that needs to be translated that's not translated. Because if I said man, you might think I'm referring to Ken. Ken doesn't live on bread alone, but on everywhere that comes from the mouth of God. But that's not what it says in the Hebrew. There is a definite, there's a definite article there, ha Adam. What does that mean it should be translated as? The man. People can be son of man, but only Messiah is the son of man. People can be man, but there's only one, the man. And what he's saying here is the man, the Messiah, will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Hashem. What does this mean? I wonder how literal it is when Yeshua said, I have food and drink that you know nothing about. I wonder how literal he was being. I don't think he was being literal, literal, but I, I, it makes me wonder sometimes. Yeshua looks at Hasatan and says, the man, the Messiah, does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from Mount Hashem. What does this mean? He's talking about himself. The man, the Messiah, you know, Yeshua, talking about himself, will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from Mount Hashem. And what Yeshua is saying here is, the Holy One has not told me to break my fast. I am not breaking it until I hear the words coming. So, there's a few concepts we've been talking about in the context of the book of Devarim. I want to go ahead and highlight one of them. I said that this Messianic Judaism is not a Shabbat faith, but a faith that goes seven days a week. What do I mean by this? Many people come to us because they want to observe the Shabbat, because it's one of the Ten Commandments. And I say that it's very amiable. It is one of the mitzvot given to the people of Israel. Um, but we'll see it was created creation. So it shows me a good heart. But something that they sometimes are a little bit surprised to see is, okay, well, we have prayer, 9 o'clock, Monday through Thursday. Um, we also have um, New Time prayers, Minha. And they say, why all these prayer meetings? The question is, why not all the prayer meetings? But part of it is, understand that Messianic Judaism is my lifestyle, or at least is the best of my ability. I want to talk a little bit more about this today and what this entails. So what we see in chapter 7, verse 12, is a reliance upon obedience. Look at this. Because you are listening to these rulings, keeping and obeying them, I know your God will keep with you the covenant and mercy that he swore to your ancestors. He will love you, bless you, and increase your numbers. He will also bless the fruit of your body and the fruit of the ground, your grain, wine, and olive oil, and the young of your cattle and sheep, in the land that he swore to your ancestors that he would give you. You will be blessed more than all the other peoples. There will not be a sterile male or female among you, and the same with your livestock. And I will remove all illness from you. He will not afflict you with any of these dreadful diseases, which you have known. Instead, he will lay them on those who hate you. You will devour all the people that Adonai had hands over to you. Show them no pity, and do not serve their gods, because that will become a trap for you. You get the vibe, this is a prep rally. Oh, she's pulling them in and saying, come on, get hyped, you're about to enter the land. I wasn't able to, but you're gonna do it. And he's laying out before them the absolute best case scenario. And yet, this is not just the best case scenario, this is a promise. The children of Israel, no matter how much they obeyed or disobeyed, were never able to obtain this promise. But it will one day, under the reign of the Messiah, and that's why Echen is so important. The promises that we see here are contingent upon the coming of the Messiah. But let me go ahead and lay out a few more things that we should be seeing here. This covenant, these promises are not personal. They are national. They are communal. And that is what Torah is. It is the contract between God and the entire nation of Israel. It's made up individuals, yes, but this is a national covenant. And it shows that the community of Israel is not this little, I'm over here and I'm living it, and the rest of the community of Israel is over there. 
the community of Israel is a community. They are joined together. They are not separable from one another. That's why in the days of Yirmiyahu, we see that there were many righteous people who lived in Israel. There really are. Yirmiyahu mentions them. Yirmiyahu is one of them. He comes from a family of righteous people. And yet, because the covenant was national, at the end of the day, it wasn't enough. God's not like, well, these people are righteous and these people aren't, so I'm going to divide them and sit them like we. They all got punished together. But God had a way of preserving his own through it. And so what we see here is that this is a national covenant. It doesn't matter if, you know, I'm living here righteous and 99% of Israel is unrighteous. We are unfortunately in this together. And unfortunately, that also refers to the body of believers. Because you see, it doesn't matter if I know him, if I'm here from him. If there is someone up, up, up the street who's blaspheming God and teaching false doctrine and making a real stent for the kingdom, by association, we have to bear some of that too. But it goes on, because Moshe, and I'm just putting the highlights here, Moshe explains how they are to bless the Lord after they have eaten their fill. In other words, they have had their fill, they've had all the wine, they've had all the grain, they've had all the olive oil, and they're happy and they're going to bless the Lord for the food and for the land. And we do this after our services. We have our olive over here, and we have our yayin, our wine, and we just go through a quick blessing, and we eat. And then we have blessings that go after our meals. And I look at this, and what I see here is a relationship with the ground and with the community. How do I see this? This is something that this is something that we are coming back to as a society. It is easy for me to eat food and to not think about where it came from. It is easy for me to, think, uh, to eat food and not think about the people who grew it, who ate it, who, har uh, who harvested it, who prepared it, who sent it to the factory, who did whatever. I can eat food in a vacuum. But in an ancient agricultural society, you cannot have food in a vacuum. You're going to think about people who are growing it, and you're probably going to know them. Or you grow it yourself. You are preparing your own livelihood. And you're going to thank God and understand that this is not you who prepared your own food, that it came from the neighbor, but that he took care, that God is taking care of you. And there's an absolute reliance on each other, on the ground, and on him. This is one of the reasons we're doing Hashanah Rabbah. We have forgotten how reliant we are on God just said rain. And so understand that there is a relationship when we eat food with each other. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. There, there, there's a, oh, oh no, you know what I'm going to quote. There's an author I love named Arthur Bowers. And he writes about this. And author, Arthur Bowers says that his friends had a little plot planned, and so they planted some food, and they invited Arthur and his wife over, and they served them vegetables out their own garden. And he said, it became such a richer experience because I immediately associate the food with the person who grew it. And he says, and it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. What I'm seeing here is a reference to thinking God and an adherence to the community. Maybe a bit right into, let's go into Deuteronomy 11. This one is important, and we should know this. So if you listen carefully to um, verse 13. So if you listen carefully to my mitzvot, which I am commanding you today, to love and know your God and serve him with all your heart and being, then I will give your land and its rain in the right season, including the rain and fall rains and the late spring rains, so that you can gather in your wheat new wine and olive oil, and I will give your fields grass for their livestock, and the results that you will eat be satisfied. This is very similar to what we saw in chapter 6. And so when you find similar verbiage between two passages of the Torah, my encouragement to you is find the difference. What's the difference? It doesn't translate in English. But let me show it to you. Open up this door. This is the second paragraph of the Shema. I'm on page 48. This is the passage we had last week. Mahavta et Adonai Elohecha. They call Vavka, Upanashika, Upama Adecha. What is this? He say it in the singular. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. Singular. Next page. 
page 50. Vahiyahi, I'm, I'm sorry, Vahiyahi, Vahiyahi, Shemoa, Kishu, Elitzota, Asher Anoki, Mitzame, Echem, Hayom, Levavka, Et Elahechem, Olavadon. What's the difference? The first paragraph is singular, the second paragraph is plural. It has changed. And now what Moshe is saying is not talking to the individual that you love God. Now what it's saying is you as a nation, as a community, must love God and obey him. And the rabbis, they put it like this. You pick up your yoke as an individual and you start walking with your yoke, the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, and then you look around and you realize many other people are carrying the yoke too. You are part of a community. You are not doing it by yourself. This parashah is way more concerned with the community. Let me tell you something. And I'm going to say a message that flies in the face of what I feel is really Pentecostal Christianity and what it's become. But we need to talk about it. You ready for it? Yeshua loves the congregation. Yeshua loves his people. And I'm stressing the word people in the plural in the congregation. I believe that his people who are called by his name are the apple of his eye. And that when he looks down at earth, he sees his congregation. He sees his body. That when I eat this bread, which is the body of Mashiach, it is not separable from eating it with the community. That's why in church language, it went on to be called, called communion. Union. You're taking it with each other. It is a part of recognizing the body of the Messiah. I've got news for you. Yeshua loves you as individuals, but he also loves the gathering of the saints. We are something that is all together pleasing to him. And there are many bits both in scripture, even the ones that Yeshua gave, that we cannot fulfill by ourselves. We must fulfill them together. We are not loners. We are part of a community. And I will stress this out a bit further. Messianic Judaism stands uniquely as a part of the congregation of Israel and the body of Mashiach. Church on the street, they are part of what we call the Commonwealth of Israel. That means that they are kind of under the umbrella of Israel, but they don't work under the same laws and rules. Messianic Judaism must straddle both. What does this mean? This means that I must have real friends and real connections, real friendships with people who are not Messianic, but they are part of the house of Israel. Thankfully, I do, and I know that many of us do, and we try our very best to have relationships and friendships with people who do. For example, next week, an Orthodox Jewish friend of mine who holds many great events here in the United States is coming to Nashville. I'm going to be sure to meet up with him. All right? And if you're interested in that, come speak with me. He holds events like Run for Zion, that kind of thing. And so I look forward to meeting with him and his family again. That's just one example. I have friends, though, who are in the synagogue, and they know that they have an open door here. They've been invited. We have, um, as I said, we have Cricket and her kids who came from the synagogue, but we also have Sonia, who is always welcome and frequently makes a presence every couple months. Messianic Judaism is not called to be in a vacuum. We don't live on a farm. That's Hebrew root of We don't live on a farm. We don't live in a commune. We are supposed to hold jobs, have connections and friendships with the larger house of Israel, but also just be salt and light. We are a part of a community. And Yeshua did not come to the earth and open up his own synagogue. He went to normal synagogues. And sometimes they chased him out. And sometimes, according to Luke 4.15, they said he was the best rabbi they'd ever heard, right? Everyone was speaking well of him. So he had a mixed reaction. And I believe that Messianic Jews should have a mixed reaction to the, when they meet the Jewish community. I was really tickled pink recently when I met a, like a, a connection of mine named Drew. Drew is from Israel. He came in here because he thought we were a synagogue. We explained to him who we are, said he was welcome. But he said that he was cool with us, and he went to go to the sheriff. So we bless him, and he goes to the sheriff. I saw him at Panera Bread not long ago. I say not long ago. 
not long ago, it could be 10 years ago, but it, it, it was somewhere last year. Um, uh, I, I saw him and I, I said, Drew. He looks at me, he takes him a moment, says, Quentin. And we start talking. And he says, and he and I are talking, and I, I make a snide remark, and I say, aren't I pleasant? And he says, well, you know how it is, two Jews, three opinions. And I realized that there had been a connection, at least of some form of friendship. He recognized this as a Jewish, to some degree, institution. Understand that if we're to turn off our non believing Jewish friends and visitors, it is not to be for being arbitrary or strict. Let the Lord be the offense, Lord Yeshua, or let him be a light. You might find that your Jewish friends are drawn to him, not stay away from him. And there have been friendships that we have lost with Jewish friends and family even because of Yeshua. Let him be the offense. Don't let it be that you're pretending to be Jewish, but you don't know Hebrew. Don't let it be that you're pretending to be Jewish, but you, you wear some sort of strange required, you know, prayer shawl. You know, I'm giving examples. Let it be for the right reasons. We're part of community. And unfortunately, I met some, I came across some Jews from West Virginia, and they said every time we meet a Messianic Jew, they're crazy. And I have to think that, and my roommate was there, and he was talking about me, and he said, Quentin says the, the same thing. The truth is, we're a community, and very often when a Messianic someone claiming to be messianic talks about flat earth or film blank unfortunately it damages the whole movement we are not loners we are part of the community and we're not separate from each other what does acts 422 say i loved it when we had that post from the wall i need to go find it what did the believers do in the first church every day they gathered together okay for prayer, that's one. Breaking bread. Breaking bread. For the apostles' teaching, for the fellowship, for the breaking of bread, and for prayers. The apostles' teaching, New Testament, for the, uh, the Chavarah, the fellowship, for the breaking of bread, for communion, and for prayers. Prayer is plural. It applies to me in liturgy, but I digress. Understand that when we come together, there is a special manifestation of God's presence that I cannot obtain alone in the prayer closet. Don't mishear me. Don't come here if you're not praying alone in the prayer closet. Go home, be in the prayer closet, get alone with your God, know him, but when you come together, what we're doing is we're sharing our walk with God in a corporate setting. There is a manifestation of God that can only be obtained together. Just like there is a manifestation of God that can only be obtained in the prayer closet alone. We've got to have both. And when I come here, I'm going to say something, and I'm not sure it's true, but I feel like it's my life. I feel like there is a special form of ministry that I can only have in the body. And when I come here, it's not because I'm the teacher, but when we come here, we have our job ahead of us. That means that every single person here is responsible to the other person. People that you come across to share their walk with God, to encourage, to build up, to edify, to rebuke. In love. We are called to love each other loudly. This is a gathering of the Kohenim. This is a gathering of the priests. Let's take it very seriously. Scripture says, how will the world recognize us? By our love for who? One another. One another. Faith in Messiah cannot exist in a vacuum. I want to be part of a community that loves, worships, prays, and reads the scripture publicly. That is what I want to be part of. But more than anything, I want to be part of the community of Yeshua. We have celebrations ahead of us. But please keep in mind, I also want to see the hayride. I also want to see the corn maze. Also keep in mind, I want to be invited to some of your houses for dinner or to your sukkah, and I want you to come to mine. I want to have Havdalah, I want to have Kiddush. 
I want to have Kavanah Shabbat. I want to have Mincha. I want to have these things. I want to be with you. I want to be with each other. Because at the end of the day, I want to be with the Messiah. And I recognize that he is present when I am building up and edifying his body. Why do I have to say this so often? Well, I feel like we grew up in a fair, I grew up in a very individualistic spiritual community. It's all about my relationship with Jesus. That's important, but what about ours? What about the I can help you as best I can, everything you give to me is yours? That's important. I want to be a part of a community that loves passionately. Not just, I love you, Ken. Can I give you a ride? No. I'm busy that day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a part of a community that shows the Messiah whenever we come together. I want to be a community that studies together. Well, of course you say that, Quentin, you're bored. No. I want us to have a great time at it. I want us to eat while we do it, and I want us to be very serious about the scripture, but I also want us just to be able to enjoy the presence of God. This past Thursday, the Lord kind of laid up my heart how to change the Thursday prayer, uh, Thursday prayers. I said, we're opening up this door, and we're reading the Mikha service. So you know what that means, then. Ashray, it's the Amida, um, it's the unique nation, and it's the Takhanu. Four things, super easy. The Lord just came, and it's like, whoa. And we started praying things, and things started coming out, and it was a beautiful manifestation of community. But why was it there? Why was I even able to hear him? Well, because I'm with the Lord in the prayer closet. I'm with the Lord in the prayer closet, and when we come together, I just want to share, I'm like, we're going to do it differently. And then, boom, the Lord came in the prayer meeting. That's how these things work. And I was thrilled to share it with Jimmy. And what would happen if Jimmy wasn't there? I'll tell you what would happen. I may have gotten quite the ride, and Jimmy would have been able to have missed out. It's just all the times that I have missed out on the Lord because I was lazy about the gathering of the saints. But I don't just want exciting holidays together either. I want boring days together. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I was going to school. I was going to school. Did I, did I turn out normal? I think I did. But I was homeschooled. And I was also raised in a post-9-11 world. Which means we don't eat out. Which means you don't get in the car unless you're dying. Because that's expensive. Alright, everyone remember what it was like? It's actually still like that. Um, but my family spent many, many, many days indoors. And the best memories were built up not on the exciting days, the every once in a while when we could go out to Walmart. But it was the everyday mundanity. Because we were able to enjoy the quiet, enjoy enjoy the boring, we actually grew very tight as a family. I find that families that are able to enjoy boring days together you don't have to be at the soccer game, you don't have to be here, you don't have to be at this event. This, they're able to be close, and they're able to actually have greater clarity because they don't need constant entertainment. Mm -hmm. I read a story about a man who grew up on a farm, and it was the same thing. They had one vacation day a year, where they got to go to town and see a movie and eat out of a restaurant. That was it. And yet, he didn't hate his childhood. He loved it, because, because they were alone, and they had so much quiet. They were able to expand their minds, and they had a huge array of hobbies and activities that they, that they could engage in. Boring days were beneficial to them. We weren't made to be constantly stimulated. Boring days too. I want boring days with you guys. I want boring days like last night. Nothing happened. The Lord showed up. It was good. I felt like it, it was good. But nothing happened. No gold dust fell from the ceiling. No fire. No angels. No, no demons. Nothing happened. And yet it was good. Close the books. No more. Boring days too. I want the good. I want the bad. I want the ugly. All y'all are my family, and I want to have it with you. I want to be with the saints. I want to pray with you. I want to worship with you. I want to read scripture with you. I want to study with you. I want to eat with you. I want to tear out that fence with you. Uh, I think we got work on that. Um, this is life, and we can do it together. We 
can observe Christ's presence together, and we can look forward to when we're going to be able to do it together forever with Him in eternity. The days of the reign of the Mashiach. Amen? Amen. Israel is not separate from each other. The disciples of Yeshua are not separate from each other. We are family, we are community, we are one nation. Um, Father, thank you so much for the community, the Chavarah, the fellowship. Lord, I pray that even if our Chavarah is we invite our neighbors out to have a prayer meeting with us, or just to a kid dinner, or to Jesus, my rabbi, I pray that no matter what that fellowship is, that we are in fellowship and that we are in prayer with one another and that we are ministering to each other. Father, help us to see that the community of Messiah is absolutely vital to our faith. I don't want any more lone messianics. I don't want any more lone believers. I don't want, I just want to be with you. I want to be loving on your body. Lord, I pray that you give us opportunities to love each other, to love each other loudly, to love each other publicly, to love each other genuinely as you loved us in the cross. Thank you so much for this fellowship. Thank you so much for this body. For those who aren't able to come today because of health issues or any other reason, please pray for them. Father, we pray that you bring them safely home next week. That we're able to enjoy their fellowship together. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to page 162. Let's close up. This is a really short sermon on paper. Yeah, just keep going. Okay. 162, Ain't Kill Ain't You. Ain't Kill Ain't You. Ain't Kill Ain't You. Blessed is our God, blessed is our sovereign, blessed is our ruler, blessed is our deliverer. You are our God, you are our sovereign, you are our ruler, you are our deliverer. You are the one to whom the ancestors offered the incense offering. I'll spare us the Elenia today. We'll go down to page 166 of the Benet and Mark. The prophet Zachariah said that God will be ruler over all the earth, and on that day God will be one, and God's saying will be one. Benet and Mark, Bahaya Adonai, Lamelech of Haaret, Bayom Habu. Bayom Hahu, Yeye Adonai Echad, Ushmaho, Ushmaho, 